Hey guys, in this video we're going to continue our discussion from last week about using truth tables to test for validity. To do that, I thought we would just go over question 9 from last week's homework. So, um, some of you got that question right and you got all of the points. Some of you got it kind of right and got some of the points. And a lot of people got um, either very few or no points on that question. In addition, I got a few emails from students who did get all the points but didn't quite understand why they got that question right. So that's really important. I thought that we would go over this whole thing and clarify what's going on um, and use that as a jumping off point to start using truth tables to test for validity in uh, more complex arguments. So remember, question nine asked, in the following four argument patterns, these four on the board, modus tollens, modus ponens, denying the antecedent, and affirming the consequent. It asked which row on the conditional truth table is most useful to determining the validity of the argument pattern. So we did the example with modus ponens in the video and uh, I just want to run through that again and slow it down and really talk about what's going on and then we'll go ahead and repeat the process with the other three argument patterns so we can see what the right answer was in that question and more importantly why those were the right answers or how certain rows help us test for the validity of these four argument patterns. Okay, before we get started, I want to make a note of something that I don't think I made clear enough last time. And I think it's going to help us get this conversation going and, uh, and make things make sense. So on a truth table, each row represents one possible scenario, one way for the world to be. Um, so in row one, we have the case that uh, there is a possible scenario in which P is true, Q is true, and if P, then Q is true. It's one of the rows on the truth table, and that means that it's one possible scenario, or it's one way that the world could be. Okay, the, another, uh, the next point I want to make, and it might even be more important than that, is that all of the rows on the truth table represent all of the possible ways for things to be. So we have four rows on our truth table with a single simple conditional claim, if P then Q. That means that when we're talking about a claim like if P then Q, there's only four ways that things can be. There's only four ways that things can turn out. Um, each one of these rows represents one of the ways that the world could be in reference to a conditional claim. This might be um, like mind-blowing and it might be really boring to some of you and it might be really confusing to some of you. Um, the important part is that it's going to be relevant to all of you. So keep that in mind. I wrote it here under the truth table so that we can refer back to it and it's something that you should also write in your notes so that you can keep it in mind while we're doing things like testing for validity with truth tables. Okay, so let's start with modus ponens. It has two premises. Um, it says if P then Q, P therefore Q. So our first premise is if P then Q. So I'm going to write this a little bit higher to give us more room to write. So premise one again is if P then Q. So when we're testing for validity, we want to know um, in which rows on the truth table are both of our premises true. So let's start by looking at the rows on the truth table in which just premise one is true. So premise one is true in which rows? It's true in rows one, two, and four. So we're looking at the whole premise which is if P then Q. We're saying if P then Q is true in rows one, two, and four. It's not true in three. Okay, so we know that it's true in rows one, two, and four. All right, so we already know that whichever row is going to help us determine the validity of this argument pattern, it's going to be either one, two, or four. And that's because um, we know that at least one premise is true in those rows. Uh, so let's look at what rows premise two is true in. So in modus ponens, premise two, is P. So what rows is premise 2 true in? Premise 2, P, is true in rows 1 and 3. Alright, so this is true in rows 1 and 3. So we know which rows each of the premises is true in, 
Now we need to look at which rows are both of the premises true in. Because remember, for an argument to be valid, what we're trying to see is um, whether or not it's possible when both of the premises are true for the conclusion to be false. In a valid argument, it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. So but if that's what we're looking at, uh, we need to start by looking at all of the possible scenarios or all of the rows on the truth table in which both of our premises are true. So uh, in row one, are both our premises true? Yeah. So it's possible that row one is going to be a row that helps us determine the validity of modus ponens, but let's keep going. So premise one is also true in row two. Is premise two true in row two? Premise two is P. P is false in row two. So we know that row two isn't going to help us determine the validity of this uh, argument pattern. Um, what about row four? Nope, again, only one of our premises is true in row four. So that's not going to be a row that can help us. What about row three? Again, no, only one premise is true in row three, and we want to look at the row or the rows in which both of our premises are true. It turns out that there's only one row here in modus ponens in which both of our premises are true, and that's row one. So that's where we're going to focus our attention. At this point, you have the answer to the question on the homework assignment about which row is going to help determine the validity for modus ponens. And that's row one. But let's keep going to make sure that we understand why that's the case, or how row one is going to help us determine the validity of this argument. So again, an argument is valid if it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. So in a valid argument, we want to know that in all possible scenarios in which the premises are true, that is, in all rows on the truth table in which the premises are true, then we'd want to know that the conclusion is also true. That would mean that it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. So if in every row on the truth table in which both of our premises are true, it turns out to be the case that the conclusion is also true, then we have a valid argument. So let's see. Our conclusion in modus ponens is Q. So we want to take, um, go over to our row in which all of our premises are true. We want to see if the conclusion is also true. So our premises are true, and what about Q, our conclusion? It's also true. That means that in every possible scenario in which our premises are true, the conclusion is also true. There's only one possible scenario in which all of the premises are true, and in that scenario, the conclusion is also true. So it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false, as the truth table shows us that the only possible way for things to be is for these two premises to be true and the conclusion to also be true. So that means that modus ponens is a valid argument, and that is how we use the truth table to help us determine validity. We saw that it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false, because in the one row in which the premises are true, the conclusion was also true. Now, if in this row the conclusion was false, that would mean that an argument was invalid. That's not the case here, but that's what we're looking for in an invalid argument. For a valid argument, we know that um, when the premises are true, the conclusion is also true. Okay, so let's move on to modus tollens, and we can start moving a little bit faster, but we're still going to practice all of them. So in modus tollens, we read, if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Okay, so not Q and not P aren't on our truth table, but we know that negation just flips the truth value from our variable. So whenever P is true, we know that not p is false, and vice versa. That is, our truth table for p and not p looks like this. So when p is true, not p is false, and when p is false, not p is true. So instead of writing out a whole new truth table that also has not p and not q, you could either um, just remember to flip your truth values when you're dealing with not P and not Q. Or, if you're still feeling a little bit shaky, which totally makes sense, 
Um, and you don't want to write out a whole new truth table that adds a column for not P and not Q. You can just use like a different color marker or something like that or a different color pen and make a little note for yourself about what the negation of each variable is going to have for its truth value. So I wrote with a red marker a negation sign next to P and a negation sign next to Q. I'm going to use that red marker to fill in my truth values for not P and not Q. So again, I'm just flipping the truth values. So whenever P is true, that means that not P is false. And whenever P is false, that means that not P is true. And it's the same for Q. When Q is true, not Q is false. And when Q is false, not Q is true. Okay, so I have a red marker here um, that we use to fill in our, uh, our negation, our truth values for the negation of these two variables. And that's going to help us um, move a little bit more smoothly through um, modus tollens. So again, our first premise for all of these is if P then Q. So I'm just going to leave this on the board. Premise two in modus tollens is not Q. And I want to see in which rows the second premise is true in. So in which rows is not Q true in? Well, not Q is true in row three and in row four. So not Q is true in rows three and four. Okay, and now uh, we have all of the rows in which each of the premises are true. Next step, we look at which rows they're both true in. So we eliminate all of the rows except for the one or the ones in which both of the premises are true. So are they both true in row one? No, only one is true in row one. What about row two? No, only one premise is true in row two. What about row four? So row four, actually, both of our premises are true. So that might be one of the rows that could help us in determining the validity of modus tollens. What about row three? Nope, only one premise. And uh, here we have row four again. So we know that actually there's only one row on the truth table in which both our premises are true. So again, we have our answer kind of early about which row is going to be the most helpful in determining the validity of modus tollens. It's row four, because that's the only row in which both of the premises are true. All right, so we have our row in which both premises are true. Now what? Now we see whether or not the conclusion is true. If in this one row in which the premises are true, the conclusion is also true, then we've got a valid argument. But if the conclusion is false, then that means that the argument is invalid. That means that there's some way for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. And in a valid argument, if the premises are true, it's impossible for the conclusion to be false. Okay, our premises are both true, our conclusion is not P, we go over to not P, we come all the way down to row four and we see that not P is true. That means that this is a valid argument. In all of the scenarios in which both of the premises are true, there's only one, but if there were more, we'd need to check all of them. In all of the scenarios in which both of our premises are true, the conclusion is also true. So that's valid. Um, I dropped my green marker, but here it is. We're going to mark modus tollens as being a valid argument. Okay, moving on to affirming the consequent. So I'm going to erase some of these things again. Affirming the consequent reads, if P then Q, Q therefore P. Again, we have our first premise here. Um, we know that it's uh, true in rows 1, 2, and 4. Our second premise is Q. So in which rows is our second premise true? We look at in which rows uh, is Q true? So Q is true in rows 1 and 2. All right, now we have to look at which rows both of our premises are true in. Are they both true in 1? Yeah, so, so far, 1 might be a row that could help us determine if affirming the consequent is valid or invalid. What about row 2? Both the premises are true in row two also. So it could be row one or it could be row two that helps us determine the validity. Now we're really gonna have to um, go through some more steps and see. What about row four? Nope, 
only the first premise is true in row four, so row four won't help us. But maybe row one and maybe row two will help us, so we have to see. So in row one, both of our premises are true. What about our conclusion? Our conclusion is P. Is P true or false in row one? It's true. Does that mean that this argument pattern is valid? Well, hang on. We don't quite know yet. So for an argument to be valid, it has to be the case that in every row on the truth table, when the premises are true, the conclusion is also true. So for um, an argument to be valid, all of the rows have to be true with the premises and true in the conclusion. But for an argument to be invalid, then it only has to be the case that in one row, your premises are true and the conclusion is false. So we've only tested one row. We can't say if an argument is valid until we've tested all of the rows. So let's test the next row in which the uh, both premises are true. And that's row two. So in row two, both of our premises are true, but what about our conclusion P? Well, in row two, our conclusion P is false. So that means that row two gives us a situation in which the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So the truth table tells us that, sure, in some scenarios, it could be possible for these premises to be true and the conclusion to be true, but in some scenarios, at least this one case, it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. If an argument is valid, it has to be impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion to be false. So there can't be even one row on the truth table or one possible scenario in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So row two gives us that one possible scenario in which the premises are true and the conclusion is false. So row two tells us that this is an invalid argument. This is invalid and we know because of the information that we get in row two. Okay, so now let's move on to our last one. This is denying the antecedent. And this reads, if P, then Q, not P, therefore not Q. All right, so our first premise, the same. Our second premise, however, is not P. So you want to know in which rows is not P true? In which rows is our second premise true? So we come, we're again looking at negation, we're looking at not p, so we come over to our little red uh, truth values, and we say that not p is true in row two and in row four. So uh, premise two is true in rows two and four. Now we look at which rows are both of our premises true in. Row one? Nope, only one premise is true in row one. Okay, what about row two? They're both true in row two, so maybe that's one that will help us. What about row four? Row four, they're both true, so maybe that one will help us. So we're looking at rows two and four, knowing that one of them is going to help us figure out if a denying the antecedent is valid or invalid. So most students chose row four as the row that helps, uh, that's going to help you determine whether or not denying the antecedent is valid or invalid. So let's start there. So in row uh, four, we have if P then Q is true, and we have not P is also true. So what about our conclusion, not Q? In row four, not Q is also true. So row four gives us a possible scenario in which both the premises are true and the conclusion is true. Has that helped us so far determine definitively if this argument pattern is valid or invalid? Nope, not yet, because there's more than one row in which both of the premises are true. And so row four, uh, even though it gives us a situation in which the premises and the conclusion are true, uh, it doesn't let us say yet that this argument pattern is valid. So now we have to check row two and see what that says. So row two, premise one is true, premise two is true. What about the conclusion, not Q? Is not Q, remember that's in red, is not Q true or false? In row two, not Q is false. So row two gives us a scenario in which the premises can be true, but the conclusion is false. So 
Row 2 tells us that actually this is an invalid argument pattern. So again, I'm going to use my red marker. We're going to X this one out and say, nope, that's not a valid argument pattern. We know because of the information we have in row 2. So modus ponens we know is valid because of row 1. Modus tollens we know is valid because of row 4. Affirming the consequent we know is invalid because of row 2. And denying the antecedent we know is invalid also because of row 2. So hopefully that helps clarify uh, what we were talking about in question 9 on the homework. And hopefully that helps give you a head start on using truth tables to test for validity of arguments. So we're going to do, um, we're going to use truth tables to test the validity of arguments that are a little bit more complicated. And uh, if you have any questions about those, make sure that you're consulting your book and your notes from these videos and from the book. And please let me know if something still doesn't make sense or if you still have questions about the material.